declarations of interest in relation to Andy Adams? Yeah, um, it makes reference to fire support network on page 31, and I'm sure it probably does somewhere else, but I just declare that I'm a trustee of that chair. Chair, same for me, I'm a trustee of that chair. Any matters of agency? The minutes of the last meeting held on the 12th of January 2016 are submitted for approval as a correct record of the signature by the chair. Approval of the minutes. Today on the third quarter, so that includes April 2015 to the 31st of December 38 service delivery plan function plan action points. At present, six are fully complete. They include the new ways of procuring, which is now established, the Firefighters Pension Board, which is established and meeting regularly, and the members room, which you're all enjoying, I'm sure. The majority of them are progressing really well and are nearing completion. There's a few of them with actions, within actions, that may carry on to next year. Seven key performance indicators that we report to you. Fifteen have met their targets, and I will report on all of these in the first slides. Uh, six are within ten percent. Three have failed to reach their targets. Two are reported annually, and one at the moment we're unable to report by comparing with other data because of the new stars HR system we have in place. We have no historical data in it yet for absence, but we can report on six percent of all we should. indicates that there are or above target. We have accidental dwelling fires. To the end of quarter three, there were 787 accidental dwelling fires. This is like 19 less than this period last year. The number of RTCs from April to December were 406, and this is 52 less than last year. Deliberate antisocial behaviour fires, 3,359. This is less than last year again. However, quarter three included the bonfire period, and there were 1,040 incidents in quarter three, compared to 1,147 in, one <coughs> in quarter one, which is unusual because of the bonfire period. 92.6 of fires we attended were confined to a river of origin. This is against a target of 92%. And we attended all life risk incidents within 10 minutes on 95.7%. This is pretty consistent around 95% throughout the year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that? <laughs>
going on today. Areas where our key performance indicates you're within 10% of targets. Total number of fires on. indicated within 10% of targets. There were 5,723 fires attended from April to December. This was over our target. However, again, taking into account the bonfire period, in quarter three we attended 1,780 incidents. In quarter one, which was April to June, we attended 1,980. So again, it's an unusual bonfire period. <coughs> were 1,952 primary fires. That's over the target of 1,257. However, throughout the year, it's been pretty consistent around the 640 mark each quarter. Deliberate fires in non-domestic premises in quarter three. There were 24 incidents. Nine of those were at Old Courts, Walton and Kenneth prisons. Again, consistent throughout the year. A deliberate vehicle Have you got sight of the, the slides? I have. Yes. Okay, so do, do, to try and progress things, if you just use the slides that you've got, um, obviously members have got the information in front of them, so they'll be able to follow it without the necessary requirements to provide a presentation. Okay. There were 401 delivery vehicle fires this year. And usually there are high number involving bikes. In Liverpool, there were 52 involving bikes, in Wirral, 54. It seems to be Liverpool. In quarter three, there were 159 vehicle fires in Liverpool, 16 of them, well, 16 of them were bikes, and in Wirral, 23. And we are supporting Merseyside Police on the campaign against the use of scrambled bikes on the road. KPIs where we did not meet our targets, sadly, again, the number of fatalities. There were further four fatalities in quarter three, which I'll, I'll put in the next slide. There were six RTC safety fatalities to date. This is less than last year when there were eight. In quarter three, we had two in, in one incident in December. And injuries on routine duties, there were 15 recorded. This is over target, but two less than last year, and none of them were of serious nature. The number of fatalities and accidental dwelling fires. There were two in November and two in December. Two in November were a male aged 85 and a female aged 84, and it was a suspected fault on a fridge freezer that caused the fire. In December, there was a 48 year old female, which the cause of the fire was thought to be an e cigarette rupturing her oxygen tube, and an 88 year old female who accidentally left paper on the cooker. There have sadly been 32 in the book since then, which will be reported on next time. Of all of those fires, seven were above the age of 65. Seven were due to smokers' materials. They spanned in age from six years old to 88 years old. Seven were female, five were male. With regard to the sickness absence indicator, with the new STARS system, we can now report that in quarter one, there were 1.82 shifts lost to sickness absence per head of all personnel. In quarter three, that went to 3.24. It's a rolling figure, which is accumulated as the data goes in. In quarter three, it went to 4.39. The target is 7.54. If the trend continues, barring the flu season, um, it's looking like at the end of the year, we'll have six days lost, which is under target for the first time. Greybook was 5.77. Days lost to sickness, green and red, which is non uniformed, 
Tito's six days lost to sickness. Two indicators that are reported on annually, and I will report to you on next time, obviously at the end of the year, are the, to increase the diversity of our workforce and volunteers to reflect the local communities we serve, and the percentage of staff appraisals completed during the fourth quarter of each year, the staff that work at that time. Apologies for the presentation, not oh, working at all happened there. Are there any questions? <coughs> In relation to the uh, technology going crazy, uh, in relation to the car to the port, just pick out some kind of issues which I think you would like to bring to the attention of members. Um, Jack has gone through some of the car areas where we are performing well, and you look at the in relation of packs down to down five being below target. Uh, you look at the, our response to incidents, so our attendance time being up, you know both the exceeded uh, kind of expectations of the authority um, and the number of injuries incurred and accidental qualifiers again being below the target that's been set. So it's kind of contrary to the fact that we've had an increase in the number of fire fatalities over that period. In effect, we're having less accidental ground fires. There have been less people injured in those accidental ground fires. We are getting to those incidents as quickly as we possibly can, but they're still, you know, well, probably by the end of the year in the region of 14 fatalities across Merseyside. And members will be aware that at points in time we've had numbers as low as five, six, five deaths over the same period. And that has caused us some, some concern, as you would understand. And it's been part party to um, the debate which occurred in, in Westminster, which was predicated on an approach by uh, Margaret Greenwood MP in regards to um, some of the issues that she thought was related to funding of Merseyside Fire and Rescue Authority in the broader scheme and whether the impact on funding cuts to the services had had an impact on the number of fire fatalities. And we've done a little bit of work around subject matter now. Um, and we, you know, we do, and we've exchanged some correspondence with uh, ministers within the Home Office and officers within the Home Office to suggest that we, we, we believe that um, it's not necessarily funding cuts that are being applied to Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service per se, but the broader funding cuts that are being applied to the public sector. So you know, the public sector is becoming more and more challenged and what we believe is, for people who live in the more deprived areas of, of the country, Merseyside being one of those areas, that they, those individuals are less resilient than other sectors uh, and other areas across the UK, um, and are less able to kind of manage some of that, those cuts uh, more, more locally. So and that's part, part of an ongoing uh, discussion really about how we can kind of address that. Members will be aware now we've introduced a new home safety strategy which is focused on the most vulnerable people in our communities, targeted towards those over 65 years of age, and we are utilising data provided by health services, uh, particularly around additional vulnerabilities around mobility, etc., to be able to target our resources as effectively as we possibly can, and that will be you know, reported back to the authority over the period. But the fact that we have suffered 14 fire deaths is obviously of a concern, but in, in the context of a reducing number of accidental dwelling fires, and reducing the number of injuries. So you know, that, that will be the focal point for our home safety strategy moving forward. In regards to um, sickness absence and the kind of three months <coughs> total, which is uh, being referenced by um, Jackie and part, part of the presentation, members will be, be aware. I've done extensive work around trying to tackle you know, that levels of sickness absence across Merseyside over the period, and we've introduced a number of HR policies to support that. That was part, part of arrangements within the forward plan to report back around the implementation of those uh, HR policies to this committee. And it's our intention to bring a more substantive report around sickness absence and the introduction of policies back to this group uh, for consideration, scrutiny, before potentially being forwarded on through to the full authority. But what we are seeing you know, more recently over the last number of months is a reduction in sickness absence across the service, not just specifically within operational roles but within green and red book roles so non-operational roles as well and we are putting that down in the, you know, in the first instance to the introduction of those new HR policies but also you know the supportive approaches that have been adopted by the authority in regards to their occupational health and well-being of our staff and um, but we will encompass all of those kind of details within the report which I would suggest chair we bring back to the next committee.
mentioned um, the fatality involving somebody um, with an e-cigarette and um, <coughs> that catching fire with their oxygen supply. Um, and, and clearly, um, I know there's been a fire in Wallasey and an older person where um, their key, I think it was, was using home oxygen. Can you just describe how the system works when people are um, discharged from hospital? Because I've seen for myself sharing the information more and <coughs> excuse me, making sure that you know, particularly older, vulnerable people, um, you know, actually get the support that they need when they get when they get home because you know, you go home from hospital, um, you're obviously confused, you're unwell or you obviously need the oxygen supply at home. Um, and really, you know, are we alerted? I, I don't I suspect that we're not when somebody is moving out of hospital. cigarettes is just another curse, you know, and particularly the use of them, and, 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 and again, more so the actual the charging of them, really, but the um, home oxygen really scares me to death, really, particularly amongst older, vulnerable people. That's what I'm saying. Just to give some reassurance, we are providing the information around home oxygen use, and that data is shared with ourselves, and you know, it's shared relatively
what you'll find, people that are often discharged um, and, and discharged into the home environment, they will be provided with carers, and the carers will put in place a care plan for the individual, um, and should oxygen be involved in that individual's well-being, then carers will be advised them not to smoke, and, and clearly, you know, when utilising the oxygen supply, and that would extend to any one of our members of staff going around who would be enforced the same kind of uh, principles. However, on occasion, people disregard that, and we have had occurrences where people who are smoking um, while still receiving the oxygen and, and put themselves at heightened risk. And we can advise the individuals, but we're not only going to be in the room with them when they are um, undertaking that, that unsafe practice. E cigarettes is maybe a little, a, a, a little different, really, in that regard, um, because we've had two incidents now of individuals who have. Where any cigarette has discharged molten contents, which has subsequently resulted in the loss of the oxygen supply. Um, so, you know, it's either caused under these circumstances the individual to be uh, exposed to a, 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 an increase in, in, in fire um, as a result of the kind of the oxygen enhancing the uh, development of that. So, that's causing burns, which subsequently have given their well being and their current. Um, Health has had an impact on the, the ability to kind of to survive that kind of particular instance. And on another front, the actual known contents, you know, cut off the oxygen supply and attempting and endeavouring to reinstate that, uh, the individual suffered a heart attack and subsequently died. Now you could classify both of those fires as not necessarily being related to the fire or smoke inhalation. However, we are categorising the fire deaths given the fact that actually had the fire not occurred or had the mold contents not been discharged on the e-cigarette, the individual would still be alive. So it would be really you know, inappropriate for us to not classify them in that way. You know, Heighten our awareness and awareness of crews to the potential risks. So when we go into people's homes where there is e-cigarettes uh, being used, it's, it's not it. You know, well, it's not clearly on occasion, it's not a safer. Uh, mechanism to you know, in, enjoy getting the nicotine kind of fix. And um, we are reinforcing some of the kind of key issues and key messages which are make sure if you are charging any, any cigarette, you're using the appropriate charger, be provided with the, 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 the cigarette itself because clearly we've been on occasions where we've had incidents because the charging unit has been different from the e-cigarette itself. And that's caused it to overheat and then discharge the contents. And clearly if you are Utilising any smoking material, whether it be any cigarette or be an actual cigarette, it shouldn't be undertaken whilst uh, it shouldn't be undertaken while you are admitting oxygen to yourself as well. That should be part and parcel of the care plan. Certainly, as you know, operational crews and prevention staff, we would advise of that, um, and, and we would hope that our the carers who are providing that care would be our eyes and ears to continue to reinforce some of those key messages to particularly vulnerable individuals. But just to re reassure you, those messages do go out, um, and that information around oxygen um, users within the home is shared with Merseyside Fire and Rescue Service, and it allows us to target our resources as effectively as we possibly can. Um, but we are prepared to have those arrangements in place for when the individual arrives, rather than when the individual arrives and then there's a slight lag um, for us getting our team out to provide them a better place. Uh, and that is work in progress because we've currently got station manager Phil Burns working around um, hospital discharge and whether we can do that more effectively to you know, put in place the safeguards prior to the person being discharged from hospital rather than after the discharge from hospital, if that makes sense. Can I ask what the current advice is with regard to the use of uh, gas bottles? Because I've noticed as I visit people and walk around the streets, first of all, People are not using, or they've got inadequate heating in their homes, so they're using these gas bottles. <coughs> and then you see a lot of them dumping and flighted everywhere. Just this morning, I drove past the street and there's a load of black bags and two gas bottles on the road. So, what's the advice to people if they can't afford heating? Is it safe? Uh, it worries me to death, and especially the older people as well. Yeah, and some of this, some of this relates to a, li uh, a little bit of fuel poverty. To yeah. be perfectly honest with you, I mean, you know, you'll know, see more recently <coughs> confess around um, smart meters and the likes, and yeah. people haven't, you know, people who are vulnerable who have to go and charge their their cars and come back and haven't got the money to be able to kind of uh, cope with that. 
lots of different ways to heat in their homes. Um, and where we would come across that, certainly you know, gas bottles and, and utilising heating in that way, is probably something that we would kind of try and steer away from and you know, encourage someone to choose an alternative means. And in the past, you know, we've you know, endorsed and recommended people get oil-fired radiators, yeah. rather than necessarily heating their whole home with the kind of a, you know, the central heating system, uh, or putting on an expensive fire, or a, a small gas-fired, uh, oil-fired, sorry, yeah, radiator, yeah. close to them, you know, to them, avoids any unnecessary risk to them of being set on fire and so on and so forth. So that would be our recommend, you know, recommendation. But again, that's as we get across those thresholds where we come to someone who's more vulnerable, we identify you know, inappropriate heating methods being utilised, then we would advise against that and look to put in place alternative arrangements. And as we've gone through the winter period, you know, people bring them out of the, the garage and put them in and, you know, and, and then we put them back again. So on occasions our crews will go in on a nice sunny autumn day, you know, and not come across any inappropriate heating, but then come across the, you know, January, February becomes cold, people started to introduce those heating methods in. So it's about just that heightened awareness. But if you are you know, come across individuals who are utilising those heating methods, we would advise against it and we would much prefer them to use an oil fire uh, radiator which can be moved from room to room if they are trying to manage their bills, but we've got mechanisms in place that prevention teams are able to signpost to a multitude of, of agencies there who are able to support an individual if they are concerned about fuel poverty um, and, and start to work with them because sometimes, and we will have been through this before, there are individuals who don't know what benefits that they can receive and so they're sat in a cold, damp room um, and, and aren't able to secure the kind of the appropriate care and appropriate uh, financial recompense of some of the kind of the provisions that are currently out there. So, you know, it's again about referring those individuals into ourselves, we'll deal with it, or advising them to find an alternative heating method. Well, this particular individual I went to see two weeks ago, um, I referred him to his social landlord. The whole block of flats where they are have got inadequate heating. Old electric storage heaters that were not fit for purpose. And, unfortunately, the flat, they're in a listed building as well. So there's a whole host of problems and we're trying to work it through with the landlord. But I, I was, I, do you know what, I couldn't live there. It was like a fridge. The room was like an absolute fridge. It was terrible. I think and the man's in his 60s and got health problems as well. <coughs> if, if you want to outside of the meeting, certainly if you give me you know, the contact details yeah. of the individual <coughs> or the, the, the actual housing provider, we will certainly pick that up and we'll have a discussion with them about whether we can work with them to kind of... Yeah, just on the, um, the uh, absenteeism, how are we getting along? Are we still letting people self roster? Yes, we've got a number of duty systems now, mm -hmm. self roster being, being a part of it, and that will have contributed as well mm -hmm. to the reduction in the number of students' <coughs> absence and um, shifts lost that we've, we've experienced over the more, most recent months. So when we bring that report back, it will be a combination of changes to duty systems, introduction of capability procedures, some of the, the kind of focus we've provided around the health and wellbeing of our staff yeah. over the period, which has seen us can, you know, turn what was an increasing number of sickness absences to a decreasing number of sickness absences as well. So I think we are starting to start to manage that issue particularly effectively. And you go back to the, you know, to something we said a long time ago. But you know, if people are, are off and they're off sick, then unfortunately that has a knock-on effect now of potentially that fire engine being unavailable. And so if we can reduce the amount of sickness absence to the, the you know, bare minimum, uh, then we are keeping as many fire engines available across Merseyside, and that's got to be a good thing. So we will bring that full report back to the members uh, at the next performance. Yeah, we used to have the card, didn't we, where you just want a card. That's a while back, wasn't it? Just funding the dead money in the budget just to like dollars, you know, something like that. To, you know, yeah, but you know, like an incentive. It's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? We moved away from it, you know, from incentives, and certainly I think it was other, other time. Um, and you know, when we did have drawers for the cars for, for people who had been had no absence over the whole 12 month period, and so on and so forth. And whilst We've changed that and we've moved away from that and we're seeing reductions in the, you know, the levels of sickness absence. I do still think there's something in 
in relation to cars and you can warn people for their presenteeism rather than their absenteeism and recognising the kind of contribution to the delivery of the service. I'm not sure to the extent of giving people cars these days, but but but, but there is something in it. And then we do give certificates out as recognition. I mean, not, it's not quite the same as a car, but a certificate to every five years, 10 years, 15 years. And we've got some firefighters and we've got a, a, a watch manager called Phil Lingley, um, who has never had a day off sick in his life. He put the kids back on there. And he probably retires, he probably retires in about you know, a, a month or two. So a real kind of, you know, Fantastic achievement, really. 30 years without a day off is an incredible achievement. Um, and to do some of those things it should be recognised absolutely. Uh, so, okay. any, any more questions? Uh, okay. well, do, do members accept the recommendation of page 30? Page 49. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure I'll just introduce the, the uh, presentation. Presentation. <coughs> um, this presentation relates to our work with children and young people, and as you will know, I've got the Children and Young People's Lead nationally for the Chief Violence Association, so it's something we are, and I am incredibly proud of the work that we do with young people, um, and I describe it part part of the Prince's Trust, even as it's not just about saving lives, the work that we do at the Fire and Rescue Service, it's about transforming and changing lives, and hopefully the presentation itself will speak to that regards to the work that we do. So I'll hand it over to, to Karen and Susie who will take you through some of the work that we do with uh, that particular group of uh, individuals. Yes. Um, good afternoon everyone. Um, my name is Karen Metcalf. I'm the manager for MFRS. So hopefully what we're going to do is give you a flavour of what we're doing within our youth engagement uh, department. And any questions that you'd like to ask, if you could ask them at the end, that would be great. Um, there's not a lot of um, information there, but what we'll go through with each slide is the time. Okay, so we'll go through some of the programmes individually. So we'll speak about the Princess Trust first. So for those who don't know, we've been with the uh, Princess Trust since 2002. Um, which actually I ran the very first team back in uh, uh, Kirkdale. At the moment we're in a partnership with the City of Liverpool College and Whittle Metropolitan College. We run four teams at Liverpool College and we run a dual college with Metro uh, uh, Whittle, which what that means is that we have a team leader from Whittle College and we have a programme support uh, uh, support worker with uh, MFRS. Okay, so um, from the last school term, which starts from September is 15 through to August 31st, 16. City Liverpool College from September, we ran three teams. From January, we've run a further four teams. And over the years, as well, we'll run three teams. And as you can see at the bottom, there's the uh, locations that we made from TDA, Stockton, Google Medicine, Highton, and for the little team, it's stronger. Okay, it's a 12 week program, it's a full term program for the young people to attend. We have to attend six hours a day, uh, 30 hours a week, and over that, in college terms, we have to be 420 guided learning hours. So you can, uh, can get a qualification while we're with us, and it comes in three stages or in three parts, which one is being an award, the second uh, one is entry three. And the third one is level one. The qualification is employment, team learning, community skills. The young people are chosen what level they go on. They go through a literacy and university uh, evaluation. So we do them tests with them at the beginning of the uh, program. And we also do them at the end, because what we like to do is measure their journey in education. So hopefully if you want to come in with us, at the end of the 12 weeks we can see some uh, improvement for them to go to job ready. The uh, programme is made up of four parts, one being the first one is induction, community project, great placements and find a routine challenge. Okay, some of our figures, and I haven't sort of like battled the uh, slide really with um, too many figures. Um, KPIs for participation and retention, so that's for people who 
will join us and how many we keep on. The national PTA is 83.3 and MFRS is 88.8. .8. A positive outcome, so what we mean by that is that if you go on into education, training, in apprenticeships or volunteering, the national is 75 and MFRS is number one, is 90%. Okay, you may have heard this before from uh, the deaf. We were given basic accreditation in information advice and guidance. What that means is we were uh, looked at at the advice and guidance that we give to our young people uh, for the 12 weeks they're here with us, and we met the, um, the, the standards, the national standards. And we've just recently been given direct claim for qualification. What that really means is such a big um, thing for us is normally when the uh, young people are getting their qualifications, we have to send the qualification board all of their work. However, over a matter of a couple of years, we've realised that a lot of processes that we have in place um, have reached a standard that we just do direct claims now. So rather than sending all this work of all the young people, we can just send a small sample because we, um, we realise that we do it at such a, a, a good level. I have to add, um, and I am quite uh, big on this, is that all our team leaders and programme support workers are from an educational background. So they're actually assessing at the same level that your colleges are. So we've just been given that direct things, which is great. Okay, moving forward from, uh, from this week, if you like, we're back in negotiation with Community uh, Liverpool College to cement um, into their business plan. 17, so that's from this September. We're actually in an initial talk now with um, with Nosley, who have also made an indication that they'd like to work with us through Princess Trust. And we're in primary talks with One R, which I actually met yesterday, and all but 99.9 percent they just offered me 25,000 pounds to deliver a team May, a pilot team May to. Uh, September. The little difference being is, is that they want their brand on that program. So it'll be a similar program to a Princess Trust, but we'll make it bespoke to one hour. There's some wraparound stuff around wellbeing and some more MFRS intervention work around fire safety, car safety, water safety. Um, so we're just going through a first stage one of diligence with them, but that seems great and we'll be running that from Hyper Fire Station. Um, so we're just, again, plus. Hopefully, moving on to uh, maybe uh, getting more to <coughs> Okay, that was Princess Trust. Uh, just a quick overall of street intervention. We've secured some further funding from City Safe to continue, in, to, uh, continue the outreach deployments across South and North Liverpool. Um, it's a team of 15, um, and the deployments we've changed normally was at Friday. Friday and Saturday. Susie and I have just took over governance for street intervention. So we've been doing a lot of work in the background looking at how smart we can work with city safe and get more positive outcomes. So the deployments have moved from two days to uh, a Monday, oh, apologies for the small sum, but Monday to Sunday dependent on intelligence, which we've met the team and, and, and they've sort of like welcomed that on board. Um, just a small one really, a few, uh, about 12 months ago, uh, Head Start knows we came up with um, a five or some big lottery funding uh, around mindfulness. And in the first year we've done some pilots and we managed to um, do some small programmes um, and managed to do pilot three, which was a school fire liaison officer, which we've had at St Bridges Primary School. We ran a primary fire cadet at Stockbridge Village School and we've done a, a, a beacon, our old beacon programme that those you can remember uh, with Susie at the Lord Derby Academy. And that's my side of our youth engagement. So what Susie's going to introduce is a, a new thing, well not so much a new thing, a thing that we've, uh, we've raised this year. So uh, Susie. Or on the one 
speak, so that's why it's got. Thank you for listening, and then Susie's come in on, uh, coming on this second part. First afternoon, my name is Susie Tulsi Nile, and I'm one of the youth coordinators in the Fire and Rescue Service. Um, my job is to walk, coordinate a number of youth programmes, but I'll come along this afternoon to talk to you predominantly about the fire. So what is the Fire Cadets? The Fire Cadets is a na nationally recognised programme designed to engage with young people aged 13 to 18 years of age. It never used to be a, a national programme of Fire Cadets. What tended to happen is all fire and rescue services in the UK, they just used to run their own um, Fire Cadets. Some of them were called Young Firefighters, some of them were called Cadets, young, lots and lots of different names. And basically we recognise the fact that there's too many things going on in different fire brigades, fire services. And we all need to come together um, to share best practice, really, to be honest, and to have a national brand that's recognised outside of the community. So last year, the Fire Cadet Board, um, which the deputy is actually the chairperson of, was formed. And to date, we have 32 fire and rescue services that are affiliated with the Fire Cadet Board. And we meet quarterly, and the aim of the Fire Cadet Board, as I say, is, to, is, is basically to create a national programme for the Fire Cadets. So we're all singing off the same hymn sheet, if you like. Okay, the aim of the Fire Cadets, a number of aims, opportunity to learn and engage about the Fire and Rescue Service, to support young people to make positive contributions in their community, above and beyond anything, provide safe, fun and, and enriching experiences for young people, um, instill fundamental principles of the Fire Service about self-discipline, leadership, teamwork, communication, and develop like, wider key skills in communication, problem solving, Objective of the Fire Cadets, it's about inspiring young people to make positive choices for the future. It's about giving young people something to do, they come along one night a week, um, it's all funded, they don't have to pay for it, and it's to give those young people, it's about CV building, that's what we always say to young people, it's about putting something on your CV that you're, you're helping out within your communities. The community involvement is a big one for the Fire Cadets, we do a lot of what's called social action.